Hello, how are you doing wherever you are? I hope you're doing well. Um, my name is Dr. Jess and I'm the host of this show called um, Discussion with Dr. Jess. I'm coming to you with another uh, session. I'd like to share a video I really find interesting. Uh, came across is a, doc a very short documentary made by young ladies. Um, and I wanted to watch with you and then do my little commentary. And uh, please uh, give me a minute. I don't want to be too long. I want to first have that um, documentary going through and then we can go ahead and uh, talk about what I think of uh, the documentary. It's very nice. So I will start at the beginning with that sound. So because I don't, to just be safe so you can see the introduction. So this film discuss subject that some viewers may find sensitive. A woman voice now production, I follow them, they do a good job. The film was created by a youth party of the Girls Voice Now program hosted by Women Voice Now, the Los Angeles based nonprofit organization. Girls Voice Now empower you from under resourced community to find, develop, and use the voice for positive social change through filmmaking. And just a little note here I believe in the power of uh, images, of words to convey stories, to share our experience. So this is my way to support this project. And please, if you can, support Women Voice Now, donate to them so they can continue to empower the next generation and the current filmmakers who are putting us, you know, stories about women. So the next slide, let me see. Um, so you have to learn more about Girls Voice Now, visit the website, womensvoicenow.org. So I think I'll put the audio back so we can hear. was originally made by and structured by men. In the U.S., the first school for women was established in 1939. Almost 200 years later, we still see inequalities in the education system. We made this documentary to examine these inequalities by interviewing students along with the teachers to talk about their views and experiences through four different aspects of school life. Dress code, sex education, periods, and sports. This is a schedule for change. So I will read this for you. Um, um, let me go so I want us to have a minute to kind of review what was written there. It says, currently in the US, oops, let me see. Currently in the US, I'm trying to load myself. Let me see. There you go. I'm gonna move myself a little bit. So let's go back to the, to the Video for a minute. It says currently in the US, 46% of primary schools, 70% of middle schools, and 65% of high schools follow strict dress codes. Reports state that many dress codes target by setting restriction on head wrap and skirt lengths. Black girls and curvier students are unequally targeted, according to the National Women's Law Center. So I want to make sure we get that because there's another conversation I want to have later about the hair and how we uh, objectify our girls at such a young age and uh, it backfire probably in the future. So that was the statistic that they share from the National Women's Law Center. Let's continue.
I was dress coded once. I had my sweater on the whole day, but I just took it off because it was really hot in the gym. Boys could, when we were in the thing with you, they could grab her shirt, you know, because it's hot. She looked down at my breasts and she goes, your tits are out to embarrass me. She was telling me like, um, does your mother let you out like that? Oh Lord, you should be like ashamed of yourself. One day I wore the same shorts and crop top as my male friend. I got dress coded by the teacher and he was right next to me. I just found that completely unfair because it shows that you only dress code women. Like it's only to oppress women. We had students showing up in all kinds of colors, and it just made the school feel very unorganized with students wearing skirts that were way too short or shirts that were way too revealing, but the rest of your coffee turned uniform. It's really distracting. Something that's insanely specific, when you would stand up straight, the skirt would have to fall underneath your fingertips, and if it reached above, you could get dress code in it was so strict. We were barely allowed to wear anything that was revealing. And it was never like, it's going to distract you. It was more so it's going to distract other males. It returns back to the whole policy of that young women, they're calling attention to themselves and that sexual harassment is because of what women do versus of the responsibility of those that are perpetrating the sexual harassment. If a girl gets dress coded three times, she gets suspended for a day. And the same punishment goes for a guy who sexually assaults a woman. So what the teachers put in their mind, if a woman is wearing revealing clothing, then she's asking for it. Then she's going to distract you. Then she's trying to distract you. Some of the girls got together and like fought against the like dress code for a whole week each day. Girls were wearing something that was like against the dress code. So like one day they wore spaghetti straps and another day they wore skirts and another day like like a crop top or something. A lot of the girls started petitions and got a whole bunch of people to sign it because it was outrageous. The biggest one we got over 900 signatures, I think. I was really happy to see that our, our own school, some young women led the movement to be able to have our current school uniform policy change and to be reflected on that. I hope that other administrators also see the importance of it and change those policies. So just before we go to the next topic, um, which about sex education, I want to go back to this um, important topic of sexualizing the bodies of our girls. So you hear these young girls, these little girls sharing their experience in school, how um, so, um, so, so they, they were, as you believe, I believe they say, you know, you are suspended and in school, school should be a safe place for the girls. So how come we went in a country like the US to, have strict dress code and having dress code is one thing, but the boys unfortunately are not subject to the same scrutiny because they are boys, right? Um, the girls will, will have the short skirt, the short everything. I want to start by saying there's a place and time to request the proper dress code, but also we need to talk to the boys as well and tell them that they have responsibility on how they treat the girls. But putting already this seed in the mind of little girls that how you dress, you will, you will be responsible for what happened to you. It's the reason why we have abuses and uh, in many forms, verbal abuse, physical abuse toward girls and women because the boys and the men are not taught to be responsible of their own hormonal urges. So having a young lady, a little girl in school uh, worry more about what she's going to wear than whether she has an assignment is unfair, right? So where's the happy medium? The happy medium for me will be as this young lady did, this organization did, is to promote awareness and stop making uh, women and girls' body a sexual object. Now, does a woman need, has a right to do whatever she wants with her body? Definitely so. But here, I want to make it clear that we need to be aware how we treat the boys and the girls when it comes to the bodies. It's important to tell the girls and the boys that everyone needs to respect someone else's body. And how we wear does not necessarily, what we wear does not necessarily define who we are. When we need to treat everyone with respect, regardless of what they're wearing. May they wear your head wrap, may they look curvier and all that stuff. So I want to go to the next topic at this time. So we, I'm not dragging this, but feel free to tell me what you think as well.
change and to be reflected on that. I hope that other administrators also see the change those policies. So we're going to continue with the next slide. It says only 14% of middle school and 38% of high schools teach all the topics required in SEX education. However, parents can opt out of that education for the kid in 36 states in the US. What are they saying about it? Yes. We had one sex ed class in fifth grade, and it wasn't so much sex ed. It was more like one day you're going to bleed, and a male might take advantage of you. He might say these things and do these things. You tell him no. The education at the time was very like abstain, or you get these diseases, or you get pregnant. And then everything else, I mean, I just learned from my classic. In my physical education course, we also had kind of like a health course. He was like, these are the different types of STIs you can get. If you wear a condom, you're most likely not to get it. And that's all it was. I didn't learn about IUDs, patches. There's so many things about the menstrual cycle that I had to learn on my own. There's a teacher actually that randomly just tried to objectify women. So the whole abortion thing, he was really against that. He made it really clear to me mm -hmm. in my classroom. And that time they separated us by boys and girls, and then they taught us about our menstrual cycle. And I'm not so sure what they taught the boys. We were sitting in the classroom, all of us girls were just staring around. Meanwhile, they let the boys outside for extra reason. So we're reading taught about consent and how we might be taken advantage of by men. They should also be in here having this conversation. I know there's that whole idea that like, oh, they're tiny and they shouldn't learn about that. But considering the fact that we were like 10 or 11, some guys were talking about watching pornography at oh, that age. Wow. If you have boys just know that they're their boys, they don't understand it. If you don't have a conversation with boys, if you don't teach them, if you don't have girls in the room to explain, they think it's like when you open a faucet of water and that it's that nonstop. Women's voices are constantly being silenced about the issues. Women are taught to not talk about their problems and to keep them quiet because women are supposed to be like these perfect feminine beings meant to give birth to children. Now, is to make sure that kids know that there's options. Condoms exist. Birth control for girls. There's options for you. It helps to have someone you can talk to about them. You might have a student who doesn't have a maternal figure. I know when I was younger, Ooh, that's a lot, isn't it? So in this um, section, a um, lot was covered. I think one that stood out the most with me um, was consent and um, having conversation where boys and girls should be in a room. I would say young men and young women. We are generally expecting girls and women to get the burden of taking care of intimacy concerns. And I think that's unfair. I think that's something that need to be taught and discussed with boys and men. I will even further say just like having a baby and giving birth, it's not, it should not be a woman issue that women and girls should just be at, uh, having addressed. And uh, yeah, we, we need to stop that. We need to include boys and girls in the same room, have conversation because the one that victimized the girls, that victimized them, the women are the boys and the, 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 the men. So we cannot just, if we have done it in the past, we need to change our ways and admit that um, we, are, we can just let the boys and the men out of the conversation. Granted that many would love to be part of it, but we do need to require, it's not an option, it's required for men and boys to uh, participate, to be included, to have the say, and to understand what that means to be a girl and a woman and vice versa. So the next thing will be, uh, I believe they say period, let me see. The past, the past is redeemed for points at the end of the quarter. So many times, me and my classmates. Would... So I think I'm going to go back a little bit. We I know when I was younger, I was really scared to talk about my period again, just because I feel like there's this whole stigma. If I had to go to the restroom really badly and it was period related, I would not mention it like that. Just say it, like it was an emergency. Obviously, there were some teachers that just didn't care and would tell me to go back to my seat because, again, they never got that education about the menstrual cycle. I do have a restroom policy. I believe strongly in maximizing class time. Each quarter, students are given two passes. 
if they do not use the pass, the pass is redeemed for points at the end of the quarter. So many times me and my classmates would complain about how badly we had to go to the restroom, but we were like, if I don't go to the restroom, it would push up my grade. Every semester has five months, which means you at least have to carry five times. They're more than likely going multiple times a day. So having two passes is ridiculous. <laughs> that history class, which was just like, it didn't let me go to the restroom. If I put it in before my English class, and I had to take it off sometime between like history class, I couldn't. I can understand why students might be hesitant to do this. I have always made an exception for female students that are dealing with female issues. Sometimes when I had to have to get a pad out of my backpack, I would do it super discreetly, slowly get my pad and like stick it into my sweater or like down my pants or something just so no one would see it. And I remember even just sometimes wanting to ask my friend, oh, do you guys get really bad cramps? Like, how do you guys deal with it? But I remember being super embarrassed because again, the whole idea that our periods and the problems with our periods should be kept to ourselves. So my male PE teacher basically told us that for the girls, you only get two days. And on those two days off, you're supposed to do the workout that's meant to be for punishment, which makes no sense because your period is out of your control. One of my students said something like, so-and-so, he's super sweet. I told him the other day that I think my period leaked through. So he took off his hoodie and he gave it to me so she could like wrap it around her waist. That comes from having students hear about others' experiences socioeconomic factors affect young women who are unable to afford things such as tampons or pads to address their menstrual cycle. I think they should be provided potentially in main office or a designated area. Some teachers might have menstrual products in the classroom in case a student might need it. I know that there's been conversation about having them in the restroom. You know, I have been trying to advocate in the school for more gender neutral restrooms. There is so I want, once again, I want to take a little break here. We talk about period, which is a topic that hit home. And I actually have a, a little article about it on my um, blog, womenafricablogpost.com. Um, so many things to say about the topic of period. And I don't think that's going to be the first, uh, the last, sorry. I, I It hit home. It's about young girls in the U.S., has a young girl in Cameroon. We, we, it was as if girls were not having period, even in high school. Um, and that's a shame. We need to stop, um, as you know, not caring for those basic uh, women's needs that girls may face at an earlier age. And I believed I had my first period at nine. So I was very young, I was a little girl. And, um, and uh, it's not fair that we uh, don't take into account has girls because it does affect our um, it does affect our life as women later on. We are taught to suppress our basic need, which is, you know, having menstrual cycle. A healthy girl, a healthy woman will have the menstrual cycle for some period of time in their life, once a month. So it's it's completely natural. And I'm very pleased to hear that there's a little boy that was willing to cover, help out. But that comes with educating the boys as well and the men. I do remember in high school, I remember clearly a phrase that the classmate told me we're talking about menstrual cycle or woman, men, you know, body. And then he, it, it was high school. I mean, when he said, you, you piece by, you piece blood. It's like, I was shocked. And I told him, yeah, well, that's what your mom had to do to get you here on this earth. And he was like, so speechless, you know, he didn't know what to say apparently. But yeah, that detachment should not take place. And I'm not saying that we should give detail about the menstrual cycle, but there need to be an understanding that that's something that's happening because of the gender, because it's a girl, because it's a woman. And we need to accommodate that in schools, at work. It's very basic. And, we, and I think that even at church, we need to make sure we accommodate that. And it doesn't take much. It just takes knowledge, acknowledgement, and for everyone to be on the same page on how to make things easier. Another important topic I want to point out is the menstrual product. And we need to have free one in schools, in, especially on the continent. I think that's a topic that we should have. They, and I will, I'll make sure I have another episode about that, um, focus on that. Some girls miss school because 
they were not able to have the menstrual pad. And I, my own research also revealed that. And once again, like I said, I have so much to say, and I really, it really hit home um, the topic of a menstrual cycle and period for me. And uh, it's unfortunate that we seem to still be way behind, way behind um, the uh, a, a sense of resolution. <laughs> Let's continue to watch this. Some teachers might have menstrual products for gender neutral restrooms. A bit more emphasis. Oh, important. There is a great difference in how importance is shown to sports when it comes to, you know, males and females. Inherently across the country, there is more emphasis on male sports. There tends to be more of a support system for male sports. There's a lot of funding towards that, a lot of promotion when it comes to uniforms. You know, I've heard how the female sport teams receive hand-me-downs or, or cheaper quality uniforms. The girls are put in the gym. They would follow like this workout video. Meanwhile, the boys were allowed to be outside on the field playing soccer, playing basketball, having continued. female sports, not only did they have less of a crowd show up to their games, but even if they were winning in the like championships, their accomplishments were not as highly regarded or promoted as male teams. For girls, it's a complete different story. They weren't even looked at. Like, no one showed up to the games. They weren't given the practices, the, the resources, the equipment. As females get older, the percentage of females participating in sports declines greatly because there's a lack of support. When I was like seven, I wanted to do football and I gave up on it because everyone told me you're not going to be able to do it. You know, what if I joined a boys team? And they were like, oh, it's not for girls. Like, it's just unfair. There were no resources provided to me. People are probably going to watch the boys sports. So I'm not thinking let's fund them more, but fund them equally. We had a soccer team that would take, come in and like teach the kids. It was co-ed. A lot of girls I know who were in that program grew up to love soccer. And because they were given that opportunity, they were taught at a young age, like, hey, it doesn't have to just be Barbie dolls. I would tell little girls now who have the same dreams as me not to give up and to find that person or those people who are going to help you out. Since the enactment of Title IX in the 1970, female students in sport have grown from 300,000 to 3.5 million in 2018 through 2019, and now make up nearly 43% of high school athletes, according to NBC Sport. This is great news. It's great news, and we need to do more. I completely agree that sports, uh, that's not a topic on its own. We can develop even more because I want to go through the documentary made by these smart, wonderful young ladies. Sport is more than a physical activity. It builds character, it builds competitive, competitiveness, and girls need to have the opportunity for those who want to be part of it. And isn't, and that's why I personally uh, support female athletes, female sport. And one of my favorites is Serena Williams, of course. And I don't play tennis, unfortunately, but I would love to learn and I, I'm planning to learn. My point is that um, if we just have to talk about Sarah William, the objectific objectification of Sarah William body, I mean, she's gorgeous, right? But look what she has to go through just because she was a, the best of her generation. And uh, we, we unfortunately um, have to continue to push forward conversation that bring awareness and changes in how we look at women's body, we look at girls' body and give them the opportunity to not just feel like the body should be for chabber, for beauty, for the male gaze. So uh, that's my take on this. And now we'll go to the next. So There's so much that teachers can do to create a safer environment. The first step would be for teachers to challenge their own views and perspectives. Even as teachers, we have to constantly learn and challenge ourselves, being informed, attending professional development, community events. First of all, they could start with having boys in the auditorium and like, groups and talking, having a whole fly show. Have like little meetings with girls just to like what our experiences when we got to get hit on. We should just be educated on that, men in general. I'm not asking you to get rid of it, but I'm asking that you include some female students on the board to discuss dress code when we go over it. I think teachers and staff can create a safer environment, and I think they have to end stigmatization about periods and about just women's bodies in general. And I think they should demolish restroom policy. Yes, we're not going to be able to change everyone, 
but we have to start somewhere and create a generation of people who understand consent. If all students feel comfortable and feel heard and valued, then that's what's most important. So that's Woman Voice Now, big couple of souls. I did my part, I share, and I, I, I gave my opinion. I think the solution are out there, it just a little, little video. I mean, once again, I'll go back to that and elaborate more my perspective, but this, this is a, sh a little video to just invite all of us, teacher, parents, students, uh, community member to be aware of, um, how we can improve the life of our girls in school and, and end some gender-based discrimination that has no reason to still be in in 2022. So I thank you for your attention. Once again, I'm Dr. Jess and you're watching discussion with Dr. Jess. And uh, today we, we watch a documentary together. I gave you my opinion, but I'll, I'll go back to those topics very soon and dissect. So it was just kind of a, brief overview and to just sh share with you this video I really like and I say kudos to Women Voice Now. Keep up the great work. I follow them. I, I, I try to catch up what they do and I love the work. <laughs> so have a good one and uh, until the next episode, take care. <laughs>